Um, so my name is Karl Stepanek, and I'm going to <coughs> refocus the discussion a little bit from manipulation to perception. Um, I'm from Jacobs University, and the work that I'm going to present is with other people like <coughs> Professor Andres Berg and Narunas and Zoran, who are doctoral students at Jacobs University. So my work is, or the presentation is going to be more of a tutorial. So it's going to be a tutorial on the scene registration methods, which are the most popular ones currently. So if you work in perception, probably this is going to be a little bit boring. But since this is a general audience, um, I think you would all benefit from this. So. Okay, this is the overview of the talk. I'm going to give you a quick uh, categorization of the 3D sensors which are currently available. Then I'm going to talk about steps in map building. And then I'm going to give some more details on 3D scene registration methods. In particular, visual odometry and visual slam, uh, iterative closest point or ICP method, and then our own work, the surface patches matching. Uh, in particular, the MUMC algorithm, uh, followed by some uh, recent work and conclusions. So, um, how would I, you categorize the kind of 3D sensors which are available in the market currently? I would categorize them into two broad um, categories. The really fast sensors, which are inaccurate and which have a small field of view. And then there are slow sensors, which are highly accurate, which have a large field of view, and which have a long range. So this is, these are the two basic categories. Um, in the first um, small and fast category, you have, of course, the Kinect, the Asus, the PMD, the Swiss Ranger, and the Velodyne. And then in the more accurate but slow range, you have the Faro, the Regal, and then you have a lot of custom design tilting 2D sensors. <coughs> so in the, in the first category, you have the Kinect and Asus, as I said. And these are some of the specs of these two. Uh, these are quite popular. But the, the, the interesting limitation is that the range is quite limited. It's only from 1.2 to 3.5. And the two are very similar. The field of view. 45 degrees, 50 degrees, horizontal, vertical, it's really limited. But the, they are still useful. In the Kinect, there is a motorized tilt of plus minus 27 degrees. Uh, and therefore, it needs an additional power cable. This additional tilting motor and servo is not present in the ASUS. And therefore, this runs off just one cable, a USB cable, which you attach to your computer. The kind of frame rates that you get are about 30 hertz in both the cases. And one important limitation is that these are for indoor use only, because they um, use the infrared region. Um, one nice thing about the ASUS sensor is also that the, the synchronization between the range and the color data is done in hardware. In, in Kinect, it's done in software, and so if you're moving the sensor too fast, you will, you will see that the depth data is no longer in sync with the color data. And this may lead to some problems. Then we have the time of flight sensors. In particular, I'm going to talk about the PMD and the Swiss Ranger. They used to be quite popular before Kinect came along. So the Kinect and Aces typically cost like 160 euros. Whereas these here, they cost uh, a couple of thousand. So um, the range here is a little bit better. So they have a smaller minimum range and a, a larger maximum range. The field of view is quite similar to Kinect. The resolution is smaller than Kinect, so 200 by 200, whereas uh, Kinect is like 640 by 480. Um, the frequency um, frame rate is a bit higher than Kinect. And one important limitation is that they don't, do not return any color information, whereas uh, they do return some kind of a grayscale, which is um, the reflective intensity. 
the nice thing which you can do with them, which you can't do with the Kinect, is that you can have multiple cameras in operation. In Kinects, also it works to a certain extent, but they do interfere with each other. Another great plus point is that they, uh, at least this particular PND camera, it can be used indoors as well as outdoors. So for um, rescue operations, this this might be more suitable. This is a high-end, slow, but more accurate and with a higher range and a higher field of view sensor. It's called a fo Faro Focus 3D S120, where 120 refers to its range in meters, so the range is much bigger. The field of view is 360 almost um, in vertical and 360 in horizontal. And this field of view is adjustable through um, a graphical user interface, so and it has a very very high resolution, a maximum of 41k times 33k pixels. So this is the absolute maximum, but you can set it, adjust it so that it can uh, return you something which is smaller. Um, the nice thing here is that color information is also co-registered in software and then returned to you. So this is useful. This is another high-end 3D laser ring sensor called Regal. The, the one feature it has which other sensors do not have is that its range is up till 4 kilometers. So it's, it's really high range. Um, it can be used outdoors. The field of view, again, vertical is somewhat limited, but horizontal 360 degrees. It does not return color, but it returns intensity information. And the nice thing about um, the Jacobs University Robotics Group is that we have a um, bunch of professors, and they have almost all of these sensors that I, uh, that I showed you here. So we have a couple of um, algorithms, and we test our algorithms in um, using all of these sensors. So we make sure that the algorithms are generalizable and robust. Then, of course, we have the customized classic 2D laser range sensors, which are, uh, which are coupled with a servo so that they can tilt. And this is this was the approach we also had in 2008-ish, 2009. And some of the videos which I'm going to show you are from that time. So we now <coughs> go to the second section of the talk, which is steps in map building. Step zero, the computer scientists they like to start at zero, is data collection. So. Uh, the interesting thing about data collection is that if you have a fast, small FOV sensor like a Kinect, you would generally, connect, uh, for example, run a ROS node uh, and then collect the data continuously. So the interscan distance is very small, as you can see in these, these two scans. The, they are quite close to each other. On the other hand, if you're using a slow, big range sensor, with a scanning time of several minutes, for example, you would typically have an inter-scan distance which is quite large. So this is, as an example, this is scan one, this is scan two of uh, data collected using the Regal sensor in Bremen city center, the old historic city center. And you could barely register them with your eye. It's really hard to register. There's hardly any overlap which you see. It's because the scan, uh, these two scans are like about 40 meters from each other and there is a yaw of 180 degrees. So these, such scans are really hard to register using certain algorithms, certain more popular algorithms. So step one is scan registration and this is the main topic of this talk. Um, so you, you are given scan one, scan two. Now these are two scans, successive scans, which were taken using the Faro sensor. So this is a large field of view, a relatively long range uh, sensor, slow sensor, but it has, a, um, it has also color information, unlike the Regal sensor. So these are two scans which we took in our lab. Again, if you just look at these two scans, it's, it will be really hard for you to align them in, mentally because you, you don't see any overlap. 
Um, so the question with scan registration answers is, what is the inter-scan robot motion? So the transform of the scan two with respect to scan one. This has rotation and translation, so six degrees of freedom. And then the question two, which typically is asked of a scan registration is, how accurate is this estimation of this transform? So here you see one result of registration, just a two scan 3D map um, using the 3D two scans which I showed you in the last uh, slide. So you can see that the scans, if you look from a far away view, they are quite beautifully aligned and you can see a lot of detail because the, these are really uh, high resolution, high field of view um, scans. Step two is loop closing and post graph relaxation. So the basic idea of loop closing is that you do registration successively, so scan one, scan two. Your registration algorithm gives you the inter-scan transform and the covariance matrix of the transform. Then you keep doing it, so S to S3 with respect to S2, up till Sn. And then at some point, you see that you can actually register the scan N with scan one, an initial scan. And this is called a loop closure. And at this point, you find another transform. However, it's almost 100% 100 guaranteed that if you chain all these transforms together, the transform that you get is not going to be the same as this new transform that you um, found out. And so now, what you want to do is to globally <laughs> change the transforms a little bit such that this, these two transforms become equal or as uh, close to each other as possible. And this is done using a post graph relaxation where each node of the graph is one location where the sensor data was taken and the edges are these transforms. So you basically relax the, the post graph which you can mentally visualize as um, all of these nodes having springs in between, and you relax a little bit so that the overall structure becomes more self-consistent. And the spring, each spring um, has a spring constant which is a function of this covariance matrix. So typically, if your covariance matrix says that this transform was found really accurately, you would not want to change it too much because it was found accurately. But if, um, if the covariance matrix says that this uh, transform is inaccurate, you can change it quite a lot. So that spring is quite nice. So this is exactly what I said. Then scene registration methods in general. So I'm going to give you a, a broad categorization. We have visual anometry and visual slam. We have the ICP algorithm. We have voxel space methods like the 3D normal distribution transform NDT. We have the surface patches uh, matching method, and then we have the frequency domain methods. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about visual odometry briefly, and then ICP and surface patches matching. So I would consider myself to be much more um, of an expert in these two rather than visual odometry, but visual odometry um, are not exactly the odometry part, but the the visual features we use in um, object recognition tasks also in, at our university. So visual odometry, if you want to know more details, there, there has been this really excellent tutorial in the IEEE Robotics and Automation magazine recently, as recently as June 2012, by David Scaramusa, and I would recommend this highly to you. <coughs> Some of the figures in this section are from this, this, um, this tutorial. So the steps in visual geometry is that you have an image sequence. First you do feature detection and feature extraction. The next step is that you actually, for each of the feature, you compute some kind of a local descriptor using which you match features across successive images. And then using these uh, matched features, 
you do a motion estimation. So basically, find the 3D camera transform, which includes the rotation and scale translation. The scale is unknown and will, will remain unknown. Um, using the motion estimation algorithm. And then you might do something like a post graph uh, local um, optimization. This in photogrammetry is called bundle adjustment. But this is exactly the same as post graph adjustment. Or very similar to So typical visual features. This is a nice comparison of the different features which are available. So the Harris corner um, features and the Shitomasi features are now classic. So they, uh, they have been there for a long time. Then in the two, 2000s, you had Sift and Surf. And then now we have also other um, features like Fast and Central. <coughs> so this is evaluating these features based on several different criteria, whether it's a corner detector or a blob detector. So Sift, which is the, the one feature I'm going to talk about is a blob detector. It's not a corner like the Harris corner detector. Rotation invariance, all of them are <coughs> here. Rotation refers to the, the uh, basically the image rotation in the image plane. So this does not refer to the 3D rotation of the camera as such. Scale invariant, if you go far away from the object, then do you continue to get the same features? Affine invariant. Um, in real life, the kind of deformation that you get is called perspective, but it's usually uh, approximated by an affine transform. So it is a nice property that a particular feature is affine invariant. So uh, sift and surf are. Repeatability, you see that the Harris current detector is very repeatable. And almost all of them are quite good. You have the localization accuracy, where the Harris feature detector is again quite good. The sift is considered less, uh, somewhat worse. Robustness, here SIFT is considered quite robust. And efficiency, here SIFT is considered the worst because it takes a large amount of computation as compared to the, the other features. So this is uh, sort of the pipeline of SIFT. Uh, this is a nice figure which they have in this tutorial, so I just reproduced it. It's that you start with the original image and then ap apply a Gaussian blurring operator with different parameters sigma, so the amount of bl blurring. And you have a list of such images. Then you scale the image down and again apply all these, uh, the Gaussian blurring and you apply it at several different scales. And then what you do is, to, is you subtract the, the blurred image from, for one sigma from the blurred image at another sigma. And this is called the difference of Gaussian images. And these are the kind of images that you get. And SIFT originally, as most of you might know, was introduced by David Lowe in around 2002-2003. And then SIFT features are basically consistent local extrema of this difference of Gaussian images, which are consistent across scale and space. So now next step in this pipeline is that for each of the SIFT feature, you compute a descriptor, which is a vector of length 128. And it is computed from a histogram of image gradients in the, the feature neighborhood. <coughs> the nice thing about this descriptor is that you can just use Euclidean distance between these vectors to say whether a particular feature is close to another one. And this Euclidean distance is then used to match features across two successive images. Some of the matches might be wrong, and then therefore they are removed using the, the random consensus, consensus ransack algorithm. Now I have a slide about that. And once you, are fil you have filtered all the matches, then the inter-image registration, that is the camera 3D rotation and scale translation, can be computed. So here you see uh, the kind of matches that you get from uh, for corresponding features in two images. 
Um, all the lines which are going parallel, these they are correct matches, and the crossing lines are <coughs> incorrect matches. So now you have to somehow filter these incorrect matches, and the one algorithm which is the standard for doing this is called Ransack. And this figure shows you the the importance <coughs> of removing these bad uh, matches, which are also outliers. If you don't do it, you get some kind of an odometry which is highly um, bad. Whereas once you remove, once you use Ransack, it is much better. So the basic idea of Ransack can be explained by simple line fitting. If you have several points here, and you would like to fit the best line, you immediately see visually that these points, they, they form a line, whereas these points, they are outliers. So Ransack, what it does is in step one, it randomly selects the minimum number of samples to fit a model. In this case, it is two because using two points, you can fit a, fit a line. And so using these two red points, which were selected randomly, you fit a line through them. And then you make a consensus set. These are all the points which agree with this line. So these are points which lie within some agreement threshold around this line. So you have this point, this point, this point, this point, this point. And so this is a this together, this forms a consensus set. And the model with the biggest consensus set is uh, then considered the model. So this is a very simple example which illustrates Ransack. It's a very useful algorithm. And how do we use then Ransack for visual features <coughs> mapping or basically to compute the 3D transform once you have these matches. So just like here, the model could be fitted using minimum of two points. Here um, in visual odometry, you could fit a model using um, several different approaches. So there is one classic method where you use eight points. Then there is a slightly newer, more efficient method that, which uses five points. So of course, if you use less number of, if you use an algorithm which uses a less number of minimum number of points, Ransack is going to take less time during during its computation. So it will be more efficient. And then, if you further assume that your motion is restricted in certain way, like you assume that your camera, for example, is mounted on a car, and the car has a non-ergonomic motion, that is, it does not cannot slip sideways. In that case, you can just do with one point. And then what you do is, Ransack is going to um, do its business. It's going to take the minimum number of points, fit a model, and then see which other correspondences agree with that model. And once it has found the maximum consensus set, that then it can find the camera motion, that is, do the registration. Then you can do bundle adjustment, which is a bit like post-graph optimization, and there, you don't do a successive image registration, but consider all of the images together. So you consider a graph of images. So the pros and cons of visual geometry, it uses a cheap sensor. The inter-image motion should be sufficiently small. The visual features, even theoretically, they are not invariant to perspective transformations. So, um, in SIFT, for SIFT, for example, it is claimed that it is robust up till 60 degrees of viewing angle change. However, for really far away scans, like I showed you, which we took using our slow but large field of view sensors, this is uh, the amount of your amount of viewing angle change is much bigger than this. So visual geometry is not applicable there. It is not, it is considered not robust for very long runs. And the current state of the art is that laser range finder based maps are have a much better quality currently than visual maps. Although visual geometry is used uh, in case of um, certain scenarios like underwater robotics where hardly any other information is available. So now we skip to the iterative uh, closest point algorithm. So here, the idea is to align one point cloud with another as close as possible. 
And let us first consider a simple problem where somebody gave you which point corresponds to which point. So all these correspondences are given. And the ideal equation is this, which you all know. So the Procrustes problem for given correspondences is that you have to find the best rotation and best translation. Uh, corresponding to these given correspondences. The Procrustes, the name Procrustes comes from um, ancient Greece where this was a robber who used to tr always kill his victims by trying to fit them on an iron bed, I think. So it's, it's a really gruesome story, but this, this name has stuck. So you're trying to fit a set of uh, a point cloud into another. And there, for this progressive <coughs> problem, there is a closed form solution. Here are some equations. The translation is just the difference between the centroid of point cloud A and the rotated centroid of point cloud B. So it's the final equation is really simple. But here, the rotation is not yet found. So what you do is then reformulate the problem. And finally, you have something like minimize this. And I do not want to, of course, go through the equation, but I want to just tell you that the equations are not that bad, because all you have to do is computer matrix S, which is B times A transpose. B is a, a matrix which is made out of basically um, this, this kind of a vectors, which is the difference of a particular point from the centroid in point cloud A. And this is the difference of a particular point um, in point cloud B from its centroid. And you just do a, this standard singular value decomposition and you have a closed form solution. Now we consider the harder problem. Now the, the correspondences are no longer given. And so how do you find these correspondences? That's where the ICP algorithm comes in. The step one of ICP algorithm is that you apply an initial guess transform, which is perhaps based on odometry. And this is a very crucial step for ICP, because if you do not have this uh, initial guess transform and the scans are a little bit further away, then ICP is not going to work. So you apply the initial transform and the clouds are a little bit aligned. And then you repeat certain steps until convergence. Step number two is that you assume that for this point, for example, the nearest point in the other uh, cloud is the corresponding point. For this, this is the point. And you make these, you assume these correspondences to nearest points. So there are certain um, efficient ways of computing these nearest points using KD trees, for example. And then you basically, assuming these correspondences, you solve the Procrustes problem and find the optimum rotation translation. Using this transform you, transform, you transform the current iterations point cloud into the next iterations point cloud. And you keep doing it, and the points, you can mentally visualize, they keep getting closer and closer. And at some point, they will converge and no longer change. And this is considered a solution. So uh, the caveat in ICP is that if the initial guess transform is not known and the scans are far from each other, ICP converges to an incorrect incorrect global minimum, which we also found for our SSRR examples for data that we collected at RREE in Disaster City, Texas. I think this was 2008. And uh, this is this data set is called the crashed car parking data set. And this is our robot with a tilting laser range finder uh, in the front of it. And this these two videos, they show how the data was actually collected. It was teleoperated by Zorin. And the interesting thing was that the vehicle was actually even taken inside the building and under the rubble. Th these are the range images which were collected by this building laser range sensor. So you see that it's not that informative. Odometry is next to useless in such an environment. And so, um, Basically, we have no initial guesses available for ICP. This is the ICP map. You can see that it's highly screwed up. Um, 
cannot make any sense out of it. And this is the map which was created by our planar patches algorithm. So which is this uh, map is now I'm going to use this to segue into the description of our planar patches algorithm. Um, I also have the corresponding 3D map. So you can see all these colored uh, axes. These are the estimated location of the, <coughs> the robot. You can zoom in, zoom out, look into the details of the map. This is where the, the back bumper of the car was. And the robot, if you look at it from the other side, actually went below the below the rubble at this point here. And the colors, it's artificially green, um, colored. The colors means that, for example, if you have a green patch here, it means that the correspondence finding algorithm said that patch 0 in scan 1 is the same as patch 20 in scan 2 is the same as patch 30 in scan 3. So there is this chain of correspondence which is used to color, color this map. Okay, then I come to our player matches mapping, which has basically three steps. First, you extract the planes from the point clouds, then you register them using the MUMC algorithm, which stands for minimally uncertain maximum consensus algorithm. It's related to the RANSAC algorithm. And then you embed it, uh, embed the whole map in a post graph and do a post graph relaxation. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the equation, not the details. So the plane equation is just n dot p is equal to d, where p is a point on a plane, n is the local normal uh, or the uh, the normal of the plane, and d is the distance from the origin along the normal. So this equation is well known. And so what we do is we take a 3D scan, we do a segmentation which is similar to what um, Claude was showing in the morning. Um, and then we do a polygonization. At the end of it, for each scan k, we have a set of planes which consists of the normal, the d, the uh, <coughs> polygon boundary, and the covariance matrix of the normal and d. This is a 4 by 4 matrix. And then, if you consider two corresponding uh, planes, one in the frame L and one in the frame R, then their equations look like this. And if you substitute this well-known equation in there, you get such equations that the normals, they are affected only by the rotation matrix, whereas the translation, it depends only on the D parameters. So you nicely can decouple rotation and translation. This is the one reason why the, the algorithm becomes um, quite efficient. So, now, again, we have a planar patches prochrusis problem, where somebody already gave you the correspondences. You would like to find out the rotation and translation. So for this, I'm just going to say that we have a closed form solution. So this, uh, once you have the correspondences, the, the computation is really fast. And the nice thing is that you can also compute the coherences of rotation as well as translation separately. So now I come to the harder problem, whereas, uh, which is, um, if the correspondences are not known, then what do you do? So in ICT, <coughs> you have this heuristic that you always take the correspondence as the nearest point. In this case, we use certain invariants, uh, which are the same from scan to scan. So if, if you have two planes in a particular scan, so these are two planes, planar patches, in the same scan, their normals have um, have a certain angle between them, 
and this angle will remain the same in the in the next scan if these two patches are also present in that scan. So this is this cross angle constraint which is used by us and then if in a particular scan these two planes are actually parallel then this distance between them is going to be the same in the next scan if both of them are present in that scan. So this is the second constraint. So using this we formulated the minimally uncertain maximum consensus algorithm which uses again something like RANSAC. So there is a minimum set of parameters for computing the transform. So given two scans, two non-parallel correspondence pairs are enough to find the rotation uniquely. And three correspondence are enough to find the translation uniquely. <coughs> and so it is a little bit like RANSAC, like I said. So it finds, using this minimum set, a model, and then see which other correspondences also satisfy this particular model. But we found out that just using this RANSAC approach was not robust enough. So we were not getting good uh, answers. So then we were thinking about alternatives. And the one alternative which we found which works best in practice is that instead of maximizing the consensus set, what we want to minimize is the uncertainty volume of the optimal solution. So the uncertainty volume is given by the product of determinants of the translation covariance matrix and the rotation covariance matrix. And so instead of maximizing the consensus set, we are minimizing the uncertainty volume of the consensus set, of the solution which is created using the consensus set. So this was found to work the best. And then we have some recent improvements in claim matching. So we removed almost all the parameters that were presented in the original uh, IEEE transaction robotics paper. So the user does not have to specify those parameters. They are found statistically automatically. And if color information is present, then we actually use that color information to make the algorithm <coughs> faster using color histograms. And this is something which I will present the day after tomorrow at MFI in Hamburg. And our code is available as a Git repository, so if you're interested in the code, just contact me, and I can send you the details. There is a second SSR example. This is an example called Dwelling, where it is um, some kind of a residential apartment which has collapsed, and then we collected data that, um, in such a scenario using our robot again. And this shows how the data was Collected, there was lots of rolling pitch. Again, ICP actually did not work. Sorry. Go back. And this is the 3D map of the. <coughs> you can see that there is a door, so the robot starts outside the room and then goes inside the room. And a lot of such features, you can actually fly through the, the model and see the different features which are uh, visible inside the room. So this is a model which is from the the Bremen City data, which was created using the Regal sensor, so this were about 20 scans, which were taken really far away from each other. And as far as I know, the planar matching algorithm is the only algorithm which can actually match these um, these point clouds or, or, or the, the planes which were extracted from the point clouds. And the nice thing about this data set is that we also had ground truth because the people who collected the data set, they put in markers in the scene, which uh, really highly reflective markers, using which we could calculate the ground truth, so we could compare our results with the ground truth. The colors that you see here, they are simply the intensity value of the reflected beam. So this is a really highly detailed map. This is a map of the of Valentin bunker, which is close to Bremen. It is a ruin of a submarine bunker from the Second World War. 
And this was again is based on regal data, which were matched using the plane matching. This is, I think, these are really few scans because the regal is so high resolution. You can see a lot of damage to the roof uh, due to bombs. Then uh, I'm going to have a few slides about our current work. So now I'm more interested in <coughs> lots of objects. They could be heterogeneous objects or they could be uh, similar objects like sacks, coffee sacks, or parcels, which are put together in a, in a container. And this kind of scenario is also kind of relevant to SSRI, where you have lots of things which, uh, which are could be related or unrelated, which are piled up together. So they are not nicely on a tabletop, well separated out from each other. Uh, so the problem here is to segment out these objects. And these are curved objects, not necessarily planar. So we came up with an algorithm which is based on the mean shift algorithm, which is known from um, computer vision. So people used to use the mean shift algorithm for color images. But now that we have RGBD data, uh, we extended this method so that we could use also the depth information and local geometric information to do the, the segmentation. And the <coughs> nice thing is that you, you can use color as well as all the geometric information. You can selectively take away certain information and see how things uh, the segmentation gets affected. And the end result is that you get these little patches, which are curved patches. And now we are working on merging these patches to get whole objects. There are some other examples. So here again, sacks. And you see some of the sacks, the smaller sacks, are, they are found almost in, as in one piece. Whereas the bigger sacks, they have been uh, segmented out more into or over segmented. And then it also works in normal scenes. So you, this is a scene from the BRICS camp in Fort Ventura from last year, I think. And this is a connect. Um, scan and we, we did our segmentation and it, it seems to work quite logically so this is it has segmented out the hand the, the arm and you know so the results are always very intuitive in a way so now we are quite curious as to where we can what exactly we can do with this uh, further maybe we can come up with a fast registration algorithm using these patches so the take home message is that there are several different scheme, uh, scene registration techniques out there. Which one you use depends on what kind of sensor you have, what kind of information is provided by the sensor. For example, is, do you have color? How close are your scans? This is really, really important. Is it, how is your scene geometrically? Is it planar? Is it curved? Do you want error estimates for doing slam later? And the other speakers are going to talk about this part. Um, do you want a compressed map representation? So the planar representation is really compressed as compared to the millions of points which you have. Um, the compression is more than um, times 100. And do you want to do path planning using this 3D map later on? In this case, also a surface-based based representation is much more suitable um, than a point-based representation. Okay, thanks for your attention, and if you have any questions. Any how questions? How, how fast is your plane matching um, algorithm compared to something like ICP where they both work on the same data set? Okay, so that depends on how close the scans are. So if this, uh, and also it depends on the geometry of the scene. So if, um, if, if you have something like Connect, and the scans are really close, then um, I would say that ICP would be faster than player matching. If you have things which are a little bit further away, then uh, most probably plane matching would be the only thing which would work. And it, then it depends on if your scene is really boxy, like this room, it's basically perpendicular planar patches, in which case it's going to take more time. If you have a scene like in the case of the crashed car parking, you have planes in a lot of different directions, even though they are they could be small, but it's not a boxy environment. There it's much faster. So it could be like about five seconds per pair. Um, for really, really huge 
scans, uh, like from the, the Faro or Regal, it could take like 10 seconds. But this is this is the current status, but there is a lot of scope for improvement because it's not multi-threaded, so it's running on a single thread, and it, it can be um, you know, improved quite a lot. And once you also include color information for larger scans, then also the, the time comes down. Okay, so um, in the interest of um, getting to lunch on time, I propose we um, defer further questions until lunchtime. You can uh, talk to um, Kastu um, about it. But um, once again, thank you so much for such a comprehensive introduction.